today. Today we're going to do the last uh, serious topic on the Laplace transform, uh, the last topic for which I don't have to make frequent and profuse apologies. Uh, one of the things the Laplace transform does very well, and that's one of the reasons people like it, engineers like it, um, is that it handles jump discontinu functions with jump discontinuities very nicely. Now, the OR function with a jump discontinuity uh, is, well, let's see, purple. Is a, a function called the unit step function. It's a, I'll draw a graph of it. <clears throat> Even the graph is controversial, but uh, everyone's agreed that it's zero here and one there. Uh, what people aren't agreed upon is <clears throat> its value at zero. And some people make it zero, and some people make it one, and some equivocate like me. I'll leave it undefined. So that's ut. It's called the unit step because that's what it is. And uh, it's, uh, let's say, we'll leave u of 0 undefined. If that makes you unhappy, get over it. Uh, the, uh, now, of course, we don't always want the jump to be at 0. Sometimes we'll want to jump at another place. So I'll draw that. If I want the function to jump, let's say, at the point A, instead of jumping at 0, I'm going to start uh, doing what everybody does. And you put in the vertical lines, even though I have no meaning whatever. But it makes the graph look more connected and a little easier to read. So uh, that's function I will call u sub a is the jump, the function which jumps at the point A. Uh, how shall I give it its definition? Well, you can see it's just the translation in by A of the unit step function. So that's the way to write it, u of t minus a. Now, I'm not done. Uh, there's another, the unit box. There's a unit box function, which uh, we'll draw in general terms like this. So it gets to A, then it jumps at 0, then it jumps up to 1, comes, falls down again at B, and continues on at 0. So this happens between A and B, and the value at which it, to which it rises is 1. I'll call this the unit box. It's a function of t, a very simple one, but an important one. And uh, what would be the formula for the unit box function? Well, in general, almost all of these functions, and as you'll see when you write use jump discontinuities, you can, the idea is to write them all cleverly using nothing but u of t, because it's this that will be, we'll have the Laplace transform of. So the way to write this is u, a, b, and if you like, you can treat this as the definition of it, it is, let's make it a definition, OK, three lines. Or better yet, uh, a colon and two lines, that means uh, th I'm defining this to be u. What would it be? Well, make the unit step at A step up at A. But then that I would continue at 1 all the time. I should therefore step down at B. Now, the way you step down is just by taking the negative of the unit step function. So I step down at b by subtracting u b of t. So in other words, it is u of t minus a minus u of t minus b. And now I've expressed it entirely in terms of the unit step function. That'll be convenient when I want to take this Laplace transform. What's so good about these things? Well, these functions, when you use them in multiplication, they transform other functions in a nice way. Not transform, that's not the right word. They operate on them. They turn them into other strange creatures, and it might be these strange creatures that you're interested in. Let me just draw you a picture. That, that'll be good enough. Uh, suppose we got some function uh, blah, like that. 
f of t. What would the function u a b of f of, uh, I'll, I'll put in the variable, t times f of t, what function would that be? I'm just going to draw its graph. What would its graph be? Well, in between a and b, this function u a b of t has the value 1. So all I'm doing is multiplying f of t by 1. In short, I'm not doing anything to it at all. Outside of that interval, u of a, u a b has the value 0. So that 0 times f of t makes 0. And therefore, outside of this, it is 0. So the effect of multiplying a function, an arbitrary function, by this unit box function is you wipe away all of its graph except the part between A and B. Now, that's a very useful thing to be able to do. OK, uh, well, that's enough. Again. Now I, let's uh, get into the main topic. That's just preliminary. I'll be using these functions all during the period. Uh, but the real topic is the following. Let's, let's calculate the Laplace transform of the unit step function. Well, this is no very big deal. It's the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus st times u of t dt. Aha. But look, when t is bigger than 0, this is, has the value 1. So it's the same as the Laplace transform of 1. In other words, it's 1 over s for positive values of s. Or to make it very clear, it's the Laplace transform of 1 is exactly the same thing. As you see, the Laplace transform really is not interested in what happens when t is less than 0, because that's not part of the domain of integration, the interval of integration. OK, that's fine. They both have a Laplace transform of 1 over s. What's the big deal? The big deal is. What is the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s? Will the real function please stand up? Uh, which of these two should I pick? Up to now in the course, we've been picking 1 just because, you know, there was no, I never made a fuss over it, and 1 was good enough. For today, 1 is no longer going to be good enough. And we have to first investigate the thing in a more theor slightly more theoretical way, because this problem, I've illustrated it on the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s, but it occurs for any inverse Laplace transform. Suppose I have, in other words, that the function f of t has as its transform, Laplace transform, capital F of s. And now I ask what the inverse Laplace transform of capital F of s is. Well, of course, you want to write f of t. But the same thing happens. I'll draw you a picture. Suppose, in other words, that here is our function f of t. Well, one answer certainly is possible is f of t. That's OK. That's the answer we've been using up till now. But you see, I can complete this function in many other ways. Suppose instead of completing a like, suppose I haven't told you what it was for s less than 0. Any of these possibilities all will produce the same Laplace transform. In fact, I can even make it this. That's OK. Each of these f of t with any one of these tails has the same Laplace trans, they all have the same Laplace transform. Because the Laplace transform, remember the definition, integral 0 to infinity e to the negative st f of t dt, because the Laplace transform does not care what the function was doing for negative values of t. Now, if we've got to have a unique answer, and most of the time you don't, because in general, the Laplace transform is only used for problems 
for future time. Uh, that's the way the engineers and physicists and other people who use it habitually think of it. If your problem is starting now and going on into the future, and you don't have to know anything about the past, that's a Laplace transform problem. If you also have to know about the past, then it's a Fourier transform problem. You don't, that's beyond the scope of this course. Uh, you'll never hear those, that word again. But, but uh, that's the difference. We're starting at time zero and going forward. All right, so it does not care what f of t was doing for negative values of t, and that gives us a problem when we try to make the Laplace transform unique. Now, how will I make it unique? Well, there is a simple way of doing it. Let's agree that wherever it makes a difference, and most of the time it doesn't, but today it will. Uh, whenever it makes a difference, we will declare, we will, by brute force, make our function zero for negative values of t. That makes it unique. So I'm going to say that to make it unique, now how do I make f of t zero for negative values of t? The answer is multiply it by the unit step function. That leaves it what it was. It multiplies it by one for positive values, but it multiplies it by zero for negative values. So the answer is going to be u of t times f of t. That will be the function that looks just that way that I drew, but let, I'll draw it once more. So it's a function which looks like this. And when I do this, it makes the inverse Laplace, tra Laplace transform unique. Out of all the possible tails I might have put on f of t, it picks the least interesting one, the tail zero. Okay, uh, that's a start. But what we have to do now is um, Now, excuse me. What I want is a formula. What we're going to need is, even we're going to need, as you see right even in the beginning, if, for example, I want to calculate the Laplace transform of this, what I would like to have is a nice Laplace transform for the translate. What happens if you translate a function along? Uh, how does that affect this Laplace transform? So in other words, the formula I'm looking for is For I want to express the Laplace transform of f of t minus a. In other words, the function translated, let's say uh, a is positive, so I translate it to the right along the t-axis by the distance a. I want a formula for this in terms of the Laplace transform of the function I started with. Now, the first, my first task is to convince you that though this would be very useful and interesting, there cannot possibly be such a formula. There is no such formula. Now, why not? Well, I, I think I'll explain it over there since there's a little piece of board I still didn't use. Race not, want not. Why can't there be such a formula? What is it we're looking for? Let's take a function, a nice average function. Nice average function, f of t. OK, has a Laplace transform. And now I'm going to translate it. Let's say this is the point negative a, and so the corresponding point positive a will be around here. I'm going to translate it to the right by a. What's it going to look like? Well, then it's going to start here, and it's going to look like uh, this dashy thing. Uh, blah. <laughs> da, 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 da. OK, so that's f of t minus a. Uh, it's not too bad a picture. It'll do. I just took that curve and shoved it to the right by a. Now. 
why cannot, why is it impossible to express the Laplace transform of the dashed line in terms of the Laplace transform of the solid line? The answer is this piece. Now, I'll write it this way. The trouble is, this piece is not used for the Laplace transform of f of t. Why isn't it used? Well, because it occurs to the left of the, of the vertical axis. It occurs for negative values of t. And the Laplace transform simply of f of t simply does not care what f of t was doing to the left of that line for negative values of t. It doesn't enter into the integral. So it was not used when I calculated this piece of the curve was not used when I calculated the Laplace transform of f of t. On the other hand, it is going to be needed. It occurs here after I've shifted to the right. It is going to be needed for the Laplace transform of f of t minus a, because I'll have to do, start the integration here, and I will have to know what that is. In other words, the Laplace, when I took the Laplace transform, I automatically lost all information about the function for negative values of t. If I'm later going to want that, some of that information for calculating this, I won't have it. It's no longer in, and therefore, there cannot be a formula expressing one in terms of the other. Now, of course, that can't be the answer. Otherwise, I wouldn't have raised your expectations merely to dash them. Uh, I don't want to do that, of course. Uh, there is a formula, of course. It's just I want to emphasize that you must write it my way because if you write it any other way, you're going to get into deepest trouble. So the formula is, the good formula, the right formula, accepts the given. It said, OK, look, we've lost that pink part of it. Therefore, I can never recover that. Therefore, I won't ask for it. The translation formula I will ask for is not one for the Laplace transform of f of t minus a, but rather for the Laplace transform of this thing, where I have wiped away that pink part from the translated function. In other words, the function I'm talking about now is it's a formula for, I'll put it over here to show you the function that we're talking about. It's the function f of. What is it? Well, in terms of the pink function, it's ta -da. <laughs> should not to reproduce some of that picture. So there's f of t. f of t minus a then looked like uh, this. And so the function I am looking for is this is the thing translated. But when I get down to the corresponding, this is the point which corresponds to that one. I wipe it away and just go with 0 after that. So this is u of t minus a times f of t minus a. What's this Laplace transform? OK, now that does have a simple answer. The answer is it is e to the minus as, a funny exponential, times uh, uh, the Laplace transform of the original function. Now, let me give you this formula occurs in two forms. Uh, this one is you know, not too bad looking. Uh, the trouble is, when you want to solve differential equations, you're going to be extremely puzzled because the function that you'll have to take, do the calculation on, will not look be given to you with the form f of t minus a. It'll look like sine t, or t squared, or some polynomial in t. Uh, it, it will not be written as t minus a. What do you do? OK, if your function doesn't look like that, but instead, in terms of symbols, looks like this, you can still use the formula, uh, just a trivial change of variable, 
means that you can write it as, write it instead. Now, this is one place, there's no way of writing the answer in terms of capital F of S. This is one of those cases where this notation is just no good anymore. I'm going to have to write it using the L notation. The Laplace transform of F of, and wherever you see a T, you should write T plus A. Basically, this is the same formula that, as that one, but I'll have to stand on my head for one minute to try to convince you of it. Uh, I won't do that now. Uh, I'd like to just to take a look at the formula. Uh, you should know what it's called. Uh, there are a certain number of idiots who call this the exponential shift formula <laughs> because on the right side, you multiply by an exponential, and that corresponds to shifting the function. Unfortunately, we preempted that. Uh, we do, we're not going to call it this. I'll call it what your book calls it. Uh, the difficulty is there is no universal designation for this formula, important as it is. However, your book calls this t-axis translation formula. Translation, because I'm translating on the t-axis, and it tells me what, that's what I do to the function, essentially. And this tells me what the, its new Laplace transform is. The other formula, remember it? The exponential shift formula, the shift or the translation occurs on the s-axis. In other words, the formula said that f of s minus a, you did the translation in the s variable, corresponded to multiplying this by e to the at. In other words, the formulas are sort of dual to each other. This guy translates on the left side and multiplies by the exponential on the right. The formula that you know translates on the right and multiplies by the exponential on the left. OK, what are we going to calculate? Uh, I'm trying to calculate, so I'm trying to prove this first formula. The second one will be easy, an easy consequence. Of I'm trying to calculate the Laplace transform of that thing. OK, what is it? Well. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times u of t minus a, f of t minus a, dt. That's the formula for it. But what I'm trying to express it in terms of the Laplace transform of f itself. Now, it's trying to be the Laplace transform of f. The problem is that here a t minus a occurs which I don't like. I would like that to be just a t. OK, now, in order to not to confuse you, and this is what confused everybody, uh, I will set t1 equal to t minus a. I'll change the variable. This is called changing the variable in a definite integral. How do you change the variable in a definite integral? You do it. Integral, well, let's leave the limits for the moment. e to the minus s times now, t, remember, you can change the variable forwards, direct substitution. But now I have to use the inverse substitution. t, it's trivial, but t is equal to t1 plus a. So to change this, I must substitute backwards and make that t1 plus a. How about the rest of it? Well, this becomes u of t1. This is f of t1. I have to change the dt, too, but that's no problem, dt1 equals dt because a is a constant. So that's dt1. And the last step is to put in the limits. Now, when t is equal to 0, t1 has the value negative a. So this has to be negative a. When t is infinity, uh, infinity minus a is or still infinity, so that's still infinity. In other words, this changes to that. These two things, whatever they are, they have the same value. All I've done is change the variable, make a change of variable. But now, of course, I want to make this look better. How am I going to do that? Well, first multiply out the exponential, and then you get a factor e to the minus s t1. That's good. That goes with this guy. But now I get a factor e to the minus s times a from the exponential law. But that doesn't have anything to do with the integral. It's a constant as far as the integral is concerned because it doesn't involve t1. And therefore, I can pull it outside of the integral sign and write that e to the minus s times a. Let's write it the other way. 
times the integral of what? Well, e to the negative st, 1. Now, u of t1, f of t1, dt1. Still integrated from minus a to infinity. And now the final step. This u of t1 is 0 for negative values of t. And therefore, I can, it's equal to 1 for positive values of t. It's equal to 0 for negative values of t, which means I can forget about the part of the integral that goes from negative a to 0. Uh, I'd better rewrite this. OK, leave that. In other words, this is equal to e to the a minus a s times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus s. OK, let me do the shifty part now. Uh, no, I, no, don't do that either. Uh, and that's since u of t1 is equal to 0 for negative values for uh, is equal to 0 for t1 less than 0. That, uh, that's why I can replace this with 0. Because from negative a to 0, nothing is happening. The integrand is 0. And why can I get rid of it after that? Well, because it's 1 after that. And what's this thing? This is the Laplace transform. No, it's not the Laplace transform, they said. Because you had t1 there, not t. It's the Laplace transform because this is a dummy variable. The t1 I in is integrated out. It's a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's still the Laplace transform if I make that wiggly t, or t star, or tau, or u. I can call it anything I want. And it's still the Laplace transform of f of t. So what's the answer, therefore? So that's e to the negative a s times the Laplace transform of the function f. That's what I promised you in that formula. Now, how about the other formula? Well, let's look at that quickly. Uh, that's, as I say, is just sleight of hand. Uh, but since that's the formula you'll be using at least half the time, uh, you better learn it. Uh, this little sleight of hand is also reproduced in uh, one page of notes that I give you. But maybe you'll find it easy to understand if I talk it out loud. So the problem now is for the second formula, what is I need to know what the OK, I'm going to have to recopy out the first one in order to make the argument in a form in which you'll understand it, I hope. So this goes to e to the minus a s f s, except I'm now going to write that not in f of s, since I will not be able to write the second formula using f of s. I'm not going to write the, write the first formula that way either. I'll write it as the Laplace transform of f of t. Now formally, if somebody says, OK, how do I calculate the Laplace transform of this thing? I say, put down this. Well, that has no t in it. It doesn't have the f in it either. Just I then write this. What formula did I do? I looked at that, and I changed t minus a to t. Now, how did I change t minus a? The way to say it is I changed t, because the t is always there, t to t plus a. You get this by replace t by t plus a to get the right-hand side. I replace this t by t plus a, and that turns this into f of t, and that's the f of t that went in there. That's the universal rule for doing it. OK, now I'm going to use that same rule for transforming u of t minus a times f of t. See, the problem is now I have a function like t squared or sine t, which isn't written in terms of t minus a. And I don't know what to do with it. The answer is, by brute force, write it in terms of t minus a. What is brute force? Brute force is the following. I'm going to put a t minus a there if it kills me. t minus a plus a. No harm in that, is there? Now there's a t minus a there, just the way there was up there. 
Okay? And now what's the rule? I'm just going to follow my nose. Do the same. If what's the sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Minus AS, the Bosch transform of F of, and now what am I going to write here? Wherever I see a T, I'm going to change it to T plus A, okay? Here I see a T, I'll change that to T plus A. What do I got? T plus A minus A plus A. <laughs> so if you can keep count, what does that make? Makes T plus A in the end. Ah, the peace that passeth understanding. Okay, uh, let's calculate. Let's do some examples, and suddenly uh, you'll breathe a sigh of relief that this all is doable anyway. Uh, let's let's calculate something. I hope I'm not covering up any crucial. Yes, I am. Okay, I'm covering up the U of T's, but you know that by now. Oh, uh, let's see. What should we calculate first? Uh, what I just covered up. Let's calculate the Laplace transform of. Uh, UAB of T. Okay? What's that going to be? Well, first of all, write out what it is in terms of the unit step function. Remember that formula? There. Now you see it, now you don't. Uh, so its Laplace transform is going to be what? Well, the Laplace transform of T minus A, that follows, that's a special case here, where the function, this function is 1. Or that, that one, 1. It doesn't, either one makes no difference. So it's simply going to be the Laplace transform of what T would have been, F of T would have been, which is See, the Laplace transform of u of t is what? That's 1 over s, right? Because this is the function 1. And we don't care for the fact that it's 0 for negative values of t. So that's my f of s. And so I multiply it by e to the minus a s times 1 over s. I'm using this formula. e to the minus a s times the Laplace transform of the unit step function, which is 1 over s. How about the translation? That was taken care of by the exponential factor. And minus, because this is minus, the same thing with the b. So this is the Laplace transform of the unit box function. Looks a little hairy, but you'll learn to work with it. Don't worry about it. How about the Laplace transform of, uh, okay, let's use the other formula. What would be the Laplace transform of um, u of uh, t minus 1 times t squared, for example, be? See, if I gave this to you and only you only had the first formula, you'd say, hey, but there's no t minus 1 in there. There's only t squared. What am I supposed to do? Well, some of some of you might have dig way back into high school and say, aha, every polynomial can be written in powers of t minus 1. That's what I'll do. OK, that would give the right answer. Uh, but in case you've forgotten how to do that, uh, you don't have to know because you can use the other formula instead, which, by the way, is the way you do it. Uh, so what are we going to do? This is equal to, so it's the Laplace. It goes into e to the minus s. The a is 1 in this case, plus 1. e to the minus s times the Laplace transform of what function? Change t to t plus 1. t plus 1, the Laplace transform of t plus 1 squared. So what is that? That's, that's e to the minus s times the Laplace transform of t squared plus 2t plus one. So what's that? Well, by the formulas which I'm not bothering to write on the board anymore because you know them, uh, it's e to the minus s times plus transform of t squared is 
2 factorial over s cubed. Remember, you always have to raise the exponent by 1. This is 2 factorial, but that's the same as 2. Plus 2, this 2 comes from there. The Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared. And finally, the Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s. You mean all that mess from this simple looking function? This function is not so simple. What's its graph? What's the graph of what is it we're tra calculating the Laplace transform of? Well, it's the function t squared, but multiplying it by that factor u t minus 1 means that the only part of it I'm using is this part. Because the u of t minus 1 is 1 when t is bigger than 1, but when t is less than 1, it's 0. That function doesn't look all that simple to me. And that's why its Laplace transform has three terms in it times with this exponential factor. Well, it's a discontinuous function, and it gets discontinuous at a very peculiar spot. You have to expect that. Where in this it, does it tell you it becomes discontinuous at 1? It's because this is e to the minus 1 times s. This tells you where the discontinuity occurs. The rest of it is just stuff you have to take because it's the function t squared. It's, it's what it is. Um, all right. Let me give you, I think most of you are going to encounter the worst troubles when you try to calculate inverse Laplace transforms. Uh, so let me try to explain how that's done. I'll give you a simple example first, and then I'll try to give you a more slightly more complicated one. Uh, but, but even the simple one, oh, it won't make your head ache, but uh, it'll. All right, so we're going to calculate the inverse Laplace transform of this guy. Uh, 1 plus uh, e to the negative pi s. Divided by s squared plus 1. All right, now the first thing you must do is, as soon as you see exponential factors in there like that, you know that a, these functions, the answer is going to be a discontinuous function. And you've got to separate out the different pieces of it that go with the different exponentials. Because the way the formula works, it has to be used differently for each value of a. Now in this case, there is only one value of a that occurs, negative pi. OK, but it does mean that we're going to have to begin by separating out the thing into 1 over s squared plus 1 and this other factor, e to the negative pi s divided by s squared plus 1. OK, now all I have to do is take the inverse Laplace transform of each piece. The inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared plus 1 is, well, up to now, we've been saying it's sine t, right? If you say it's sine t, you're going to get into trouble now. Okay, we didn't get in trouble before. Yes, but that was because there were no exponentials in the expression. When there are exponentials in, you've got to be more careful. Make the inverse transform unique. Make it not sine t, but u of t sine t. You'll see why in just a moment. If this weren't there, then sine t would be perfectly OK. With that factor there, uh, you've got to put in the u of t. Otherwise, you won't be able to get the formula to work right. In other words, I must use this particular one that I picked out to make it unique at the beginning of the period. Otherwise, it, won't, it just won't work. OK, now, what then is the if I know that's fine, but now what's the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus pi? In other words, it's the same function, except I'm now multiplying it by e to the negative pi s. Well, now I'll use that formula. My f of s is 1 over s squared plus 1, and that corresponds to sine t. If I multiply it by e to the minus pi s, it now corresponds to just copy it down. It now corresponds in the inverse Laplace transform 
to to what the left side says it does. So u of t minus pi times, in other words, this corresponds to that. Then if I multiply it by e to the minus pi s, it corresponds to change the t to t minus pi. Okay, what's the answer? That, whoops, what's the answer? Okay, the answer is you sum these two pieces. The first piece is u of t sine t. The second piece is u of t minus pi sine t of minus pi. Now, if you leave the answer in that form, it's technically correct, but you're going to lose a lot of credit. You have to transform it to make it look good, so that you have to make it intelligible. You're not allowed to leave it in that form. All right, what can we do to it? Uh, well, you see, this part of it is good for all, t is interesting whenever t is positive. This part of it is only interesting when t is greater than or equal to pi because this is 0. Before that, this is 0. So what you have to do is make cases. You have to make cases. The function, let's call the answer, call this f of t. The function has to be presented in what's called the cases format. Oh, that's what it's called when you type in tech, which I think a certain number of you can do anyway. Uh, you, you make cases. You have to make cases. So the first case is what happens between 0 and pi? Well, between 0 and pi, only this term is operational. The other one is 0 because of that factor. Therefore, between 0 and pi, the function looks like. Now, I don't have to put in the u of t because that's equal to 1. So it's equal to sine t between 0 and pi. What's it equal to for bigger than pi? Well, the first factor, the first term, still obtains. I have to include that. But now I have to add the second one. Well, what is the second term? I don't include the t minus pi, u of t minus pi anymore, because that's now 1. It has a value 1. So it's sine of t minus pi. But what is sine of t minus pi? What is sine of t minus pi? You take the sine curve. Ah, the sine curve. Yeah. And you translate it to the right by pi. So what happens to it? It turns into this curve. In other words, it turns into the curve. What curve is that? Minus sine t. So the other factor. This factor is 1, and this becomes negative sine t. And so the final answer is f of t is equal to sine t between 0 and pi, and 0 for t greater than or equal to pi. That's the right form of the answer.